This is a production of Cornell University. And uh, thanks for having me uh, for the seminar. Um, from root to fruit, so uh, I'm, a, I'm an Apple Russo reader. Uh, I've been um, an Apple Russo reader now for about 12 years. I, I guess when I started, I had uh, very little idea what um, uh, Apple Rootstocks were, and uh, and uh, um, uh, I had to kind of grow up and and uh, come to an understanding of what they uh, what they were thanks to uh, the help of of uh, a couple other people in, on our team, Herb Baldwinkel <coughs> and uh, Terence Robinson, who have been uh, very supportive of the program. Uh, in Geneva. And then here is uh, Jim Cummings, the uh, Mania of the Crosses that I uh, still am working on were uh, performed by um, uh, Jim Cummings. Uh, he retired uh, quite a while ago. The rest of the uh, Rootstock team is uh, at least uh, Sarah Bauer uh, and uh, Todd Halloran. And then I'd like to remember uh, Charlie who passed away a few years back. Um, he, uh, many of the trees that uh, we collect data today um, were either planted by him, uh, budded by him, or or uh, or uh, propagated by by him. And so I um, I'd like to always recognize his contribution to the program. Um, my activities at Cornell. Uh, I lead the Appaloosa breeding program. It's a joint uh, Cornell and, and ARS program. Uh, I advise graduate students. I participate in uh, in committees, uh, I, either uh, local uh, committees at, at the uh, Geneva Station, or other committees. And then I collaborate with uh, Cornell scientists um, and uh, CC Tech to advance the implementation of these uh, new technologies that that we are developing. Um, and uh, I also participate in some extension activities and field days, talks, and, and so on and so forth, as I'm asked. Uh, so those are my activities at, at Cornell. Research work, however, on Apple rootstocks requires a lot more collaboration than, um, uh, than just what we are able to do at, uh, at, at Geneva. And so we have collaborations with uh, Washington State, uh, USDA, ARS in several different locations, um, and uh, and also the collaboration of the NC140 um, scientists that are all over the U.S. and plus internationally. Uh, we have field trials anywhere from uh, South Korea to South Africa and uh, um, and, and Poland. Uh, so if you can imagine, all apple growing regions. Um, a little bit of an historical perspective. Um, we have released uh, quite a bit of germplasm uh, up to, to uh, this day. And uh, uh, this kind of tells you a little bit where I'm coming from and, and uh, how uh, breeding for a crop that has a, a 20, well, 15 to 20 year cycle in terms of uh, from the time you, you plant the seed to the time you have something that is a product. Uh, it's a, it takes a little bit uh, different approach than, than something that you can cycle four or 20 times a year. Uh, so we, uh, I, I want to acknowledge that in 1960, that's the year I was born, and Robustify was identified as a good <laughs> parent uh, for, for that. and and, uh, and Dr. Cummins retired uh, right here, and then Dr. Alwinkle retired uh, these past couple of years. But uh, we released, uh, since my joining uh, the, uh, the group, we released several rootstocks that you'll see are having a, uh, a major effect in apple production now here in the US and in the world. So I figure that maybe uh, this year we'll have uh, for rootstocks alone, now finished trees, it's, it's a, uh, to make a finished tree, it takes a couple of years. But we'll probably have about uh, three to four million plants planted. Uh, and, uh, and this is going to uh, increase every single year. 
Um, as you can see, this is uh, G41, and, and it's uh, going up there. This is G11. Um, and uh, um, these were uh, numbers that were calculated in uh, early 20, 2013, so we don't have the, uh, the newest numbers yet, but they're, uh, the projections are, are fairly good. And uh, what does that mean? That means more plants that are resistant to fire blight, more plants that are uh, replant tolerant are going into the hands of, of growers. Um, I recently attended a, uh, or, uh, presented a seminar in Illinois and, and I had a, a grower come back to me who was a, uh, uh, a small uh, pick your own operation and he said, you know, without, without these rootstocks, we would not be in business. And that's, uh, that's, that, that put, uh, put me better, uh, back in, in perspective of, of how important the work that, that we're doing uh, in Geneva is. Um, so here you see some, um, uh, maybe there's 100,000 plants in, in just in, in this. And uh, we have propagation everywhere in, in Oregon. And, and uh, now also uh, we have uh, nurseries in New York State that uh, participate uh, uh, in uh, propagation of Geneva rootstocks. And of course, we used to have some issues with, uh, with uh, propagation because the rootstocks were selected for uh, performance in the field and, and not as much as uh, for performance in, in the stool beds. Uh, but uh, as you can see here, this is propagation by cuttings. Uh, someone had the idea, well, you know, let's do cuttings out of these. And, and uh, uh, a couple of years later, 800,000 plants come out every, uh, every season. So um, I, and I, I, I'm proud of, of, uh, of the uh, nursery industry and how much they have adopted uh, our material and, and being able to work with it uh, and work with the uh, kinks. So this is, uh, this is our program in, uh, in a uh, uh, nutshell. Uh, biggest words, rootstocks, apple, and, and breeding. We, our apples are not good. They don't taste very good. But, and uh, uh, Susan Brown teases me about that. Um, but I, I can, uh, the, the good thing is that I can make her apple trees uh, produce better and, and, uh, and higher quality apples. Um, so, um, oh, forward. So this is this is how apple production was about a hundred years ago. Uh, big ladders and and uh, everybody had to go out. A whole fa you bring the whole family and, and you have sometimes uh, people just um, falling off the ladder sometimes <laughs> uh, and carrying big bags. Um, and this is the way it is, it is nowadays. In, in some cases, the apples are placed very uh, tightly and very neatly. Um, they calculate how much, um, how, how much a, uh, a single branch can, can hold or how many apples can, uh, a single branch can hold and then they thin to that uh, amount. Uh, so it's pretty impressive to see that. And uh, that would not have been possible without uh, um, the uh, dwarfing effect of the apple rootstocks confer. So you see this transition from big trees to here's a big tree that doesn't have the dwarfing genes and a small tree that has the dwarfing gene. You can see the effect also in, in fruit, uh, uh, fruit density uh, per uh, square centimeter of, of trunk. And that made this possible, which meant less ladder accidents, less, uh, more ergonomics uh, for, for picking, increased productivity. Um, I figured that the productivity went up about, uh, uh, in current uh, money, uh, 750 uh, million, uh, half, a million, half a billion to 750 uh, million dollars in the US just based on, on the uh, dwarfing effect. So, um, a while back, we figured out what the uh, dwarfing effect was uh, was caused by in our program. We did uh, we did some uh, quantitative genetics, uh, and uh, um, we identified the an additional locus that that uh, causes uh, uh, 
the dwarfing effect and, and also related it to the induction of early bearing in, in uh, Apple science. And uh, long story short, it, um, the uh, evaluations here uh, spanned about, uh, I would say, seven to nine years. Uh, so if you're looking for a quick paper, sorry, this Apple Research are not, uh, are not what you're uh, looking for. Um, but to lo long story short, there are two loci that uh, interact with each other and they affect the size of the tree as well as the productivity of the tree. And only certain combinations of uh, alleles uh, give the highest production. Uh, so nowadays, I can uh, go into a uh, marker-assisted selection scheme and select for, for uh, a certain combination of alleles and predictably uh, develop rootstocks that can produce higher uh, uh, more apples and uh, and have a certain size of tree. Um, part of our uh, arsenal that that we developed in this process was um, a a set of EQTLs that uh, um, segregated in one of our uh, big population, one of the main populations that we have. EQTLs stands for expression QTLs, and. Uh, uh, we use the QTLs in this, the EQTLs, um, in, uh, as, as additional tools to develop markers. So we look for EQTLs that are, uh, w whose haplotype is in cis configuration with the, the trait that we're studying, uh, let it be um, uh, yield or uh, tree size or, or uh, disease resistance, and then um, we find the uh, polymorphism that is contained in that in that gene, and we harness it. And uh, this is a little slide to show you a little bit what we're talking about. So we have uh, here um, powdery mildew resistance uh, that's segregating in that population, and then several uh, genes that are kind of associated with that uh, resistance in, uh, in in that region. And then uh, we take we take those genes uh, and uh, uh, essentially transform them uh, into markers uh, that uh, are mapped. We, can, we, we know where they are, and uh, they kind of look like this when we're done with it. We, we uh, utilize any kind of, of uh, polymorphism that we can get our hands on. So, SNPs or indels. Uh, indels are very nice uh, uh, because you can create nice PCR primers that uh, amplify or not. Uh, and uh, and um, that has been very useful in, in our breeding program in reducing the number of plants that, that has to go in the field. Uh, so the question comes to me then. Um, we're developing these rootstocks, and uh, and they will eventually end up in the hands of apple growers. And uh, apple growers or orchards are an interesting place because well, we have interactions. This is the rootstocks interactions. We have interactions with the soil, the pH type, structure, content, the biology of the soil. We have an interaction with scion variety that we deal with, uh, climate, temperature, amount of water that's available, diseases and insects, and then, of course, we have, I think, perhaps the most important interaction, which is with humans, management. And uh, um, I, can, I can vouch for the fact that a rootstock under different management is going to react uh, quite quite differently and, and produce a different product uh, in the orchard. So it's, it's, uh, it's tough for, to breed for orchard management, but you know, we can try. But uh, uh, these interactions, I were, uh, were hoping that uh, uh, our selection scheme is good enough to be able to account for uh, the variability we see in, in our rootstocks and, and select for the best uh, performer ones. 
So we, we go back to the, to the basics. What does a root system do in the orchard where it modifies tree architecture? Uh, you have an interface with the soil, so root penetration, anchorage, soil chemistry, pH, soil microbes, uh, it competes with other roots, so you have that um, as well. It collects nutrients in water, uh, that then it sends up to the, uh, to the scion, and, uh, and it fights infections, survives uh, in, in certain cl climates or thrives in other climates. So uh, whenever you improve rootstock functions, you end up improving the productivity of the tree uh, as well as, I think, uh, the quality of the apples that are harvested from that tree. So, and this, this is more of a general uh, thought that doesn't apply just to apple rootstocks, but it can apply to any other tree crop or vegetable crop that uses rootstocks. So there's a big push uh, or uh, with uh, tomatoes and, and rootstocks and, uh, and other crops, uh, vegetable crops that are using rootstocks. So all of these, improving all of these functions uh, through breeding can improve the overall yield uh, of the plant. A few years back, uh, we did a study with uh, um, apple rootstocks that looked at how rootstocks were regulating gene expression in the, in the scion. Or well, we had the question, do they uh, regulate gene expression? It makes sense that, 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 they, that they do. Uh, and then what, what does a rootstock modify in the scion? Um, uh, and uh, we found out that, that uh, in effect, uh, dwarfing rootstocks had different potentials to change the expression of certain genes uh, in the scion uh, dramatically. Uh, and uh, that knowledge was, was important because, well, all right, um, how, uh, because it, it went back to how the uh, rootstocks may affect um, the uh, fruit and the, the production of fruit. So you have signals that, are, that go up, and they may be of many different types. You know, here you have ethylene, but uh, oxen types, uh, gibberellins, uh, water. Water status is a big signal to, uh, to, to the scion. And then uh, individual uh, nutrients. Uh, and there are more and more things that, that the, roots are, or the root systems can do to affect the, uh, the, the scion. Um, so we decided that uh, um, we would look at some, something that was mm, sort of easy to do, uh, but, uh, but that would uh, take one of the, uh, these elements, and specifically the changes in nutrient availability. Uh, we wanted to look at what, um, what those change, if, number one, rootstocks had an effect or the uh, uh, different uh, germplasm had an effect on the same scion of, uh, to see if it, could, it would uh, uh, modify the concentration of certain nutrients in, uh, in the scion. And uh, um, also we wanted to look at how these rootstocks performed in different uh, uh, con uh, soil conditions, so pH, water, uh, soil uh, borne diseases and soil type. We also wanted to see, I wanted to see if I could mitigate uh, fruit disorders that are caused sometimes by um, the lack of or the overabundance of certain nutrients in the, in the fruit. So cal there's a very strong correlation between calcium and bitter pit um, in Honeycrisp and other apples that develop bitter pit. Uh, so for, from a breeding standpoint, the question was, can I select for increased calcium availability to the scion so that we mitigate that problem uh, in, that appears in storage facilities around the uh, uh, US and around the world? And uh, as, uh, lastly, the possibility to improve on um, fertilizer applications. What if we could apply 30% less phosphorus or nitrogen to, to the same planting and maintaining the same yield uh, 
in, uh, in, in the orchard. How, how would, uh, can, we, can, we, can we do that? And so, uh, you know, this is going back to, to uh, um, biology or root biology. Uh, we said, okay, so how are we gonna, how are we gonna study this? And uh, of course, we, in apple rootstocks, it makes sense that they, they may possess different uh, uh, channels for, for different nutrients. Um, and uh, here it goes into the roots. Uh, this is a root hair and, and then the nutrients go back up and, and you have the same scion and into the apple. So you have uh, so many things going on that influence uh, that. And I was talking uh, <laughs> uh, earlier and uh, mentioning that, okay, when you have a system that is so complex, uh, you kind of have to use the black box approach, which is um, to uh, find out what happens at, at, the, uh, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the tunnel, at the end of the process. So, <clears throat> All of the uh, experiments that I'm going to show, uh, the, the results that I'm going to show in the next few minutes, um, are, have a similarity. Uh, they're all grown on the same media or treatments, media treatments. Um, and then they have, we have different rootstocks that, that we're looking at. So we have a diversity whether it is a diversity panel of rootstocks or whether it's a structured population where we can do some genetics. And, uh, and then they all have the same sign grafted on it so that we can uh, kind of separate uh, perhaps the effect of, of uh, individual scion properties that the rootstocks may have. So uh, it's a good system. And we measure everything uh, on, the, uh, on the common scion. So uh, way back then, we devised, uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Robinson and, and uh, uh, Dr. Kreklis, uh, who was a uh, visiting scientist from Lithuania, we designed uh, uh, a, a few experiments. One that would uh, look at pH uh, effects on, on apple rootstocks, the other one that would look at um, apple replant disease and, and uh, different uh, um, soil types. And then if another one that uh, investigated the genetics of soil, uh, of tree nutrition and the uh, actual and the uh, root architecture. So, um, and we published uh, some of the results from, uh, from these studies. This is what uh, the experiments look like. This is Darius Quicklis who did uh, most of the uh, 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 real hard work here he is looking at uh, root systems and washing them and, and categorizing them. Uh, but these plants were grown in a uh, uh, randomized uh, uh, system and uh, uh, in, in these pots. These were the original plants before they were budded. Uh, uh, and uh, as you can see what a field of them looks like. And they were all individually uh, fertile irrigated <coughs> or Hand, um, uh, hand fertilized, uh, depending on the experiment. This is, there were many different experiments. So um, the first experiment that uh, uh, I'd like to talk about um, is where we have two different soil types and uh, a sandy loam and a clay loam from replant soils in New York State. Um, two different treatments within the soil, steam pasteurized and unpasteurized and uh, what we found was that uh, both the soil and the, um, uh, the treatment had an effect on nutrient concentrations in the, in the leaves. We harvested the uh, uh, five uh, leaves from each replicate, and, and so now you're looking at, at, the, at the means. Um, it's interesting that uh, the pasteurization treatment had an effect on uh, final tree height of, uh, of most plants. Um, but we, and then we find uh, nutrients like iron um, and molybdenum uh, kind of being um, 
connected somehow to uh, the, uh, the tree height, so how well the plant grew, uh, and to the uh, pasteurization treatment. And then <coughs> other um, elements that were uh, dependent more on, on the type of soil uh, than, uh <coughs> than the uh, pasteurization treatment. So the, for example, potassium was one of the, uh, those where in sandy soils uh, you would, there was a more concentration of potassium in the leaves than in not. Uh, and uh, these were, I don't know if I, they were uh, 38 different rootstocks representing pretty much the genetic diversity, the worldwide genetic diversity of apple rootstocks. Um, and after that, so you can take uh, all of that data and you can group rootstocks by their uh, nutrient concentrations and you get a graph that looks like this um, where some are in more in the higher range and, and others are really, really in the low range. And this is in the sandy soil. Uh, the picture looks a little bit different in, in clay soil. So here's another complexity that uh, I didn't want to have to work with, but guess what? It's there. So somehow it, it has to, it has to uh, um, uh, be incorporated into the knowledge ba uh, uh, base uh, uh, to develop new rootstocks. Perhaps the answer is going uh, to be to uh, sometime in the future to be able to develop something that is adapted to, to uh, most, in most soil types and most environments. Um, but my guess is that if you want to really crank uh, apples from uh, a, different, a, a certain soil type, then perhaps you can select that and you can maximize uh, that, uh, that opportunity um, using germplasm that we already have. Another complexity, um, pH. So uh, we uh, had 33 different rootstocks on and treated the uh, Cornell mix, uh, adjusted to different pH, ranging from 4.5 to 8.5, and uh, and uh, looked at what the effect was uh, of pH in general onto um, all these different rootstocks, and some. What's interesting is that some rootstocks, um, here's the uh, uh, phosphorus, uh, the uh, con phosphorus concentration in, in leaves. Uh, the rootstocks were quite different in their curves, they are individual curves. So there, is, there was a significant um, uh, nutrient concentration by rootstock interaction, uh, and well, actually rootstocks by pH interaction. Uh, so, um, so that this this becomes yet another thing that you have to worry about when when releasing uh, apple rootstocks because some some apple rootstocks that may be well adapted here in uh, low pH uh, soils uh, uh, typical of New York State may not work as well in in uh, the Rocky Mountains or other places where the pH is a little bit higher. Um, and uh, here is the uh, uh, molybdenum, for example, um, uh, which it shows uh, that the, uh, the pH treatment worked because of the uh, shape of the curve overall. So um, we found also in, in, the, in all of these data some relationships between um, uh, nutrients that were generalized uh, in, uh, among all rootstocks. So this is a relationship that between copper and, and uh, phosphorus. Uh, it's pretty strong, and it doesn't change very much by uh, the pH. Uh, and uh, I could show you maybe 50 different uh, uh, more graphs like this, and, and not all of them are, are like this. Some do change. But I just wanted to uh, mention that. Um, this is the overall picture of, of, the, uh, of the relationships uh, between the uh, pH and, and uh, uh, um, actually these are all the pHs uh, put together and uh, represents the whole data set. And you can see that some relationships, for example, between calcium and magnesium are still very significant. Or 
Here you have uh, the one that I showed you earlier between phosphorus and copper and, and so on and so forth. So, and all of these, um, all of these relationships, they tend to affect the uh, final growth of, of the plant. Okay, so uh, here's another complexity. <laughs> And uh, when you look at, at, at an individual pH uh, treatment, you can classify uh, certain rootstocks or, or kind of uh, group them together according to what they, what they like or, 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 or their similarity uh, based on, on um, uh, nutrient concentration. Okay, um, one more experiment. Uh, and this dealt with uh, the genetics. So you have, uh, so I, I show you now the water germplasm, um, and now we're going into a, a segregating population. Uh, we had three replicas grafted with gala uh, apples, and uh, um, and we're now we're looking at the uh, uh, QTLs or QTL analysis of of, of this. This is the overall status or uh, relationship of the, uh, uh, of the nutrients um, within this, this data set. And uh, the relationships that we saw earlier uh, with the pH and replant, um, uh, some of them kind of disappear, but these basically represent uh, the segregation of genes, okay? This is the variability that's caused by the segregation of genes. When we're looking at in the individual genotypic means um, here. So um, there are some things that, that uh, are uh, very well connected um, and they may share uh, same mechanisms. And you can um, summarize those relationships um, by, by looking at uh, uh, in, in this way. So magnesium and calcium, um, they seem to have very, very tight, uh, uh, a very tight relationship. That's uh, very, pretty well known in the in the literature. Um, in this case, phosphorus and, and potassium also share uh, quite a bit. Zinc and copper, uh, and then the other uh, interesting relationship was um, sulfur and manganese. And what you see right here, um, sodium was, which is a, uh, it's it's a uh, it's absorbed. In the, in I think in a very different way than, than most of these um, nutrients um, is, is the outgroup or uh, represents a, a very different beast. Um, so you take all that data and you connect it to the, to the genotypes, segregation, uh, Mendel's laws and, and so on and so forth and compare uh, means and uh, of uh, plants that have one allele, uh, a locus versus another allele. And what we found was that um, we, we could uh, uh, find significant effects caused by, by the segregation of alleles here. This is on chromosome five um, for potassium concentration in, in leaves. And uh, what's interesting here is uh, the dwarfing locus one is here, but it's not connected to to uh, to nutrient to uh, potassium nutrition uh, because we have recombinants that that show that. Uh, but and then my question to you, the audience, maybe you can you can tell me what uh, it, uh, going from uh, sixteen. Uh, milligrams per gram of potassium concentration leaves to 28 uh, milligrams per gram, that's the uh, range. What does that mean to the whole plant or the whole tree, uh, to the fruit? Uh, so I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. And if you have illuminated thoughts, uh, I would mostly uh, welcome them. But here, uh, right here, you can break down the segregation of the uh, uh, individual alleles, and you can see that there is a, a lower alleles uh, uh, combination and a higher one, and then two middle ones. Good. We did the same thing for, for sodium. 
and we found a major effect on chromosome 17. This, this uh, seems to, uh, it's uh, clo fairly close to uh, uh, the uh, S locus, but far enough to not be it. Um, and uh, uh, again, we have uh, a, almost a doubling of the uh, uh, amount of sodium in, into, into the leaves. So what does that mean to the, uh, to the tree or to the fruit? And that's what we're trying to find out. We can find copper, QTLs that, are, that uh, increase or decrease copper in, uh, in, in the plants, iron. And finally, the picture looks a little bit like this, uh, which is very complex. And so it's kind of a uh, little bit maddening. Um, and people have seen me uh, walk by my office, and I've got four screens, and I've got this, and I'm trying to understand what the relationship between this and this locus is. It, um, uh, so more data is needed. Uh, but the long, I think the message here is, is that uh, we have genetic variation that we can harness if we want to target certain uh, nutrient concentrations. So, and, and, and it's plenty, it's there. Uh, and, uh, and it's heritable. Another complication. So how, how does nutrient concentration relate to this? Uh, this is a, uh, 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 a type of, of root morphology that is also segregating in that same population that, that we were studying. And it doesn't, uh, we have like minor QTLs perhaps uh, that, that show up in, on linkage group four, but not much on, on well, a little bit on, on 11. So, uh, but we mapped the, the, uh, this, uh, um, this morphology change and uh, a, a lot of the effects are somewhat independent of, of, mor of morphology, meaning that this perhaps sits somewhere uh, in a, in a different realm of, uh, of, nu of nutrition. But um, that root morphology is so important because it shows up in about 80% of our released rootstocks. So this is a typical M9 uh, uh, root system. It doesn't branch out very much, and this is a G41, G935. Here's another one in that population, G214. And, uh, and, and so uh, we find that, that somehow this was selected based on yield efficiency, this, this, this morphology. So hmm, uh, does this affect the, the way fruit is produced? Yeah, it does. Um, it, uh, how much, how important is it? But well, we're still in the process of, of evaluating the importance of, of, uh, of that. Um, so when you see a segregating population, when you look at, at, uh, at the concentration of, of uh, calcium, potassium, magnesium, and phosphorus, and try, and, uh, try to group and, and find out different groups, you can do that. And you can find um, uh, perhaps uh, rootstocks that have uh, similarities just based on the alleles that they inherited uh, from, from, the, uh, from uh, the two parents. And you can separate them and perhaps if you um, here add uh, yield, yield efficiency and, and a few more columns, you can begin to find which rootstock has some of these properties that, that we're looking for. Um, so Right now, I've, I've mostly sp uh, spoken about um, um, leaves. We were looking at l leaves in a cyan, but uh, heck, you don't taste leaves, do you? Well, some, I know some people do, but. <laughs> uh, so uh, what about fruit? And, and so the next uh, iteration for, for this set of experiments was to look at fruit. And we wanted, I wanted to be bold. I said, oh, you know, we have the same population. Now let's move on. We, we have it in, in the field, and let's look at what happens in the field. So this is a field in Loomis. And it's, it's fairly, the, the soil is fairly uni uh, uniform. It's a silt loam. 
So we have the same population that we're, we're studying in, in, uh, in these buckets. And uh, um, grafted with gala again, uh, and it's replicated. And we collected uh, fruit and leaves for mineral analysis. Uh, I have to thank Sarah Bauer and, and, uh, and Todd Holleran for uh, working very hard to uh, 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 with this experiment, our uh, technician, because they, they work long hours preparing the material for analysis. Um, but when, when we look at fruit concentrations, okay, so, so we, here we look, in this orchard, we looked at a leaf as well as fruit from the same tree. The fruit was collected prior to maturity, so we wanted to have, uh, we, want, we didn't want to, to collect things based on different maturities. Um, and, uh, and we collected uh, five mature uh, leaves from different parts of the tree. So this is, these are overall mean, genotypic means that, that we're looking at. And, and what we see is that we have maintained the re some relationships. Uh, for example, this is phosphorus and, and potassium. Uh, and fruit phosphorus and fruit potassium, they, they are in this box right here. So those relationships are uh, still pretty strong. And then there are uh, negative relationships. And uh, so you have leaf magnesium and fruit borum that needs, seem to be um, inversely uh, uh, related to, to uh, uh, these nutrients. And we find a lot of relationships. Now, mind you, this, this right here, this diversity or this uh, uh, is is uh, genotypic, so it's segregation of genes that's causing this. It's it's and of course there is a little bit of error built into it, or more more than an error. That's that's why it's not perfect. But um, uh, so we're able to perhaps select material, uh, and this is the first time that we looked at at nitrogen in uh, in both in fruit and leaves, and we f we found this interesting relationship between um, tree diameter, fruit uh, sulfur concentration, and fruit nitrogen concentration. So as the uh, uh, trees were, uh, got bigger, you had uh, less nitrogen concentration in, in fruits, that makes sense, and less sulfur. Now I have no idea why sulfur and nitrogen are, are behaving in a similar manner. Uh, and perhaps some of you can, can explain that to me. But remember that that QTL, that big QTL that we found in in leaves of uh, in potted plants in almost the perfect environment that we could. It's not perfect. It's not as perfect as as Neil uh, as as your uh, 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 the hydroponics that you do. Uh, but um, so remember that QTL for for potassium. Well, we found it in the in the field okay we were able to uh, uh, um, find it in the field and then there it is in the leaves but guess what happens in the fruit it's gone so I don't know why uh, th but you can see that in the fruit this is uh, the uh, uh, I think the blue are the leaves uh, right here and the uh, uh, red are, is the fruit. There is very little variation that's caused by the alleles at this at, at the uh, potassium locus. That w now, because we know what gene it is, we're able to mark and, and, and figure it out. And there is a little bit of variation, but it's still detectable and significant um, based on um, uh, uh, on uh, on the leaves. Uh, and yet, fruit. Uh, potassium and fruit and leaf potassium are uh, highly correlated. So I'm scratching my head. There's there's something else that's going on here. We do have another QTL for fruit potassium concentration. It's not located here. It's somewhere else in the genome, and that's a story that will, will come later. But but um, um, how does so we, uh, and, and now we're beginning to connect. Last year we took uh, uh, fruit, some very rudimental fruit quality data. Simple one is, was uh, bricks. 
and then the, the pressure, the uh, mean fruit pressure based on, I think, 20 fruit uh, collected from uh, each individual tree in, in that population. And, uh, and now we're just looking at uh, trunk diameter and, and how those, those uh, relation, uh, the relationships between, between these. The next stage is to increase this, this, uh, this experiment to encompass uh, perhaps more fruit and look at nutrient, um, nutrient concentrations and storability and uh, bricks and, and everything. So we see, we see that the, the rootstock, at least, is having, is having an effect uh, on, uh, on bricks and uh, and the maturity of, of the of the apple, um, or how soft that apple is when when uh, after I think it was <laughs> two months of, of storage. Um, so the question is, can we select rootstocks that do a better job at, at maintaining, uh, at perhaps increasing bricks and uh, and uh, uh, maintaining a, a good uh, firmness. Uh, to to the apple, yet another complexity, but um, so what rootstocks will we choose in this case? If we were just looking at this, this population as uh, as a breeder does, and and we're looking, uh, we're discarding dwarfing and all of these other uh, elements, uh, so just based on nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium. Um, you see that they group pretty well, and, and uh, uh, potassium, uh, potassium, and, and phosphorus kind of go along together for uh, for uh, for the ride. So we can we can do this, um, but there are still a lot of questions that need to be need to be answered in, in the next five, ten, fifteen years. And depending on whether we get the uh, multi-million-dollar grants to uh, to fund this. Uh, we have plenty. I mean, if you guys have any ideas and then uh, want to want to study this, please, I, I welcome your help. Uh, but uh, what, what we have found is that uh, the uh, the nutrient concentrations can are modified by many segregating uh, loci in 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 a germplasm. Uh, tree size affects tree size. That it can affect fruit um, uh, just by just by uh, having an effect on tree size and where the fruit exposure is to the sun. Um, there is uh, r significant rootstock by genotype soil interaction. Um, is it going to be the source of the terroir for apple cider or, or uh, something like that? And the questions, um, what does, does nutrient efficiency have any effect on disease resistance? Perhaps. You know, we have interesting data that might show that. And then should we select for high or low potassium uh, in, in our germplasm? And uh, those are the easy ones, but we can do more. Uh, what genes are underneath all of, all of these and specific genes? So we were lucky to find the potassium one because there was an EQTL sitting right on top of our, of our potassium QTL, and that was like, OK. Um, but uh, can we look at different uh, nutrients? Uh, calcium, can we, can we increase calcium, uh, decrease uh, nitrogen, and so on and so forth? So um, we're uh, doing more work. Uh, we have uh, different science that, we, that we've grafted onto the, the same populations. And then we're expanding this work on different uh, other population of rootstocks. Um, so can we, um, one, one of the things that I didn't quite explain is, is that the rootstock may have certain properties in terms of absorption and translocation, but the scion may have its own properties, its own channels, its own things. And so uh, looking at the interaction is, uh, I think, is going to be critical and important. And uh, uh, how, so from from the perspective of of the uh, of the grower, how does a single gene or a couple of genes that affect nutrient uh, absorption and translocation, uh, how do how can they modify the way we manage things in the orchard? Um, 
are they going to make money or are they going to be detrimental? And, and uh, those are all good questions that uh, need a few million dollars. So if you're, uh, you know, the, the, the ride is a little bit curvy. So I, you know, I, I try to imagine myself in a Ferrari and, and if I have to build it. But uh, thank you for your time. Um, and if you have any questions. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.